now. Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, NBIA Astroparticle Seminar. I'm very happy to introduce you to Aaron Vincent, our speaker for today from Queen's University. Aaron did his PhD at McGill University in Canada, and he was a postdoc at IFIC in Valencia, Spain. Then he was a postdoc at IPPP at Durham, and then he moved to Imperial College, and now he's an assistant professor at Queen's University. Uh, Aaron is, is a well-known expert in high energy astroparticle physics uh, with a focus on neutrinos and on dark matter and also on the connection between these two. Uh, he's on the dark matter side, he has worked on or dark matter in the early universe and its imprint in the CMB, uh, the, the potential connection between dark matter and the 511 keV gamma ray line, dark matter in the sun. And, and recently he's had a, a wonderful review about global constraints on dark matter. Uh, neutrinos, uh, he's worked on many different aspects, uh, but what I just want to highlight, he was one of the authors of seminal papers on independent analysis of the, the original ice cube data, the first few batches of data that came out. Um, and he's also worked on other, other interesting topics of the solar abundance problem and uh, cosmic propagation. And today he is going to talk to us about a, a collection of different things uh, related to dark matter in, in the sun and the stars. So Aaron, thank you and please take it away. All right, thanks so much for the very kind introduction and of course for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's a little bit early here. I'm not entirely booted up, so hopefully I won't say anything too silly. Um, before I start, I'm actually going to move my presentation over to a different screen so that I'm looking at you or in your direction. There we go. Um, so just before I start, uh, Mauricio reminded me that I'm organizing a giant conference. Uh, so TEVPA 2022 is going to be in person at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. If you don't know where Queen's is, we're halfway between Montreal and Toronto. Um, if you look at Lake Ontario, so Toronto is on the top of Lake Ontario, and it kind of narrows to a point where the St. Lawrence River comes in, and we're at that point. Um, so if you walk a little bit and stare off into the distance, you would be able to see the United States if the Earth were not curved. Um, so I encourage you to visit the website. Abstract submission is now open, taking all abstracts. So please go and visit the website. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is has to do actually with that solar abundance problem that Mauricio mentioned. Um, and it's a story of, uh, it's a bit of a technical story, but I'd like to walk you through it because I think it's a really, really fun story. So it's mainly based on this paper with uh, Hannah Banks, Siam Ansari, and Pat Scott that was submitted in November of last year. It was just accepted in JCAP over the weekend. Um, but it's, it also has some roots in some old papers that I wrote with Pat Scott and Aldo Serenelli, who's a solar expert. Um, so the plan here, I'm going to tell you about dark matter. I know most of you know quite a lot about dark matter, so we'll go through that pretty quickly. I'm going to tell you what dark matter can do to stars, which sounds a bit unusual, um, what it actually <clears throat> does to stars. I'll tell you that everything that I've just said is wrong and tell you about what we've done to address that problem. Um, so Mauricio, you mentioned a little break at some point. There's sort of a natural break here, which is actually a little bit before halfway through the talk. So I can, I can pause there if there are any questions. All right, so dark matter, we know that it is there unless we've fundamentally messed up our theory of gravity and haven't been very creative in solving it. So just from gravitational lensing, from the rotation curves of galaxies, from the shape of large scale structure, uh, collisions of clusters and the resulting gravitational lensing, we know that there needs to be some non-baryonic component of matter that is causing collapse without an extra piece of pressure um, and without the ability to lose energy through radiation as baryons do. Um, the most compelling evidence and sort of the most precise evidence for dark matter and the amount of dark matter in the universe <clears throat> is arguably the CMB um, and where dark matter is causing structure, linear, linear collapse of structure, linear evolution of structure. And we need this extra component of matter that doesn't have that radiation pressure in order to avoid ridiculous amounts of damping at the high multiple tail. So here I've just fit the first peak using both lambda CDM and lambda no dm 
And you really just cannot avoid a ridiculous amount of damping and silk damping if you don't have that extra component of dark matter. And so we're inside this luminous galaxy, the Milky Way. We're about halfway from halfway to the edge of the luminous component. And the dark matter halo, based on many body simulations and based on dynamics, is something that we know should extend very far away from the luminous component. And with a large um, density that is slowly uh, dropping as a power law as you go further and further out. So we're in this um, cylindrical uh, this disk and the dark matter is in this halo and this halo is not co-rotating with us. So we know it needs to be cold, it's dark, i.e. it doesn't interact electromagnetically, and it's matter as in it clusters under gravity. So the local uh, dark matter density in particle physicist units is 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeters. In British units, it's one dark matter particle per pint, roughly, depending on the mass of the dark matter particle that you're, um, that you're interested in. And given that it's dynamically in equilibrium, <clears throat> it should follow a Maxwellian velocity distribution with a dispersion that you can get through the genes equation that is somewhere around 200 and something kilometers per second. It's not co-rotating. So as we move through the disk, as we orbit around the Milky Way, we're seeing a wind of this Maxwellian distribution of dark matter coming at us with a mean speed of about 220 kilometers per second, which is our rotational speed. So, this is what it looks like. We have our, we're going around the galaxy and we see this whim, this wind of dark matter, which could be wimps coming at us. And the purpose of direct detection experiments is to ask what if there is some non-zero uh, dark matter nucleus or dark matter electron interaction? Can I actually build an experiment in the lab to take advantage of this wind and see some microscopic effect that allows me to detect my actual dark matter and understand its properties? So direct detection of dark matter, I take a large chunk of stuff because the larger the chunk, the bigger the chance that something will interact with it. Um, I put it deep underground to shield it from cosmic rays. I make sure there's no radiation around. And then I look for dark matter flying through the earth and every once in a while. So it's so weakly interacting that it usually just flies straight through. But if you're lucky, a dark matter particle will hit a nucleus and cause a small nuclear recoil, giving you some scintillation, some ionization, some kind of signal that you can then read out. So this is deep 3600 in Canada. Um, it's three and a half tons of liquid argon, just as an example. And what you're looking for there is a signal of, of um, scintillation, which is captured by these photomultiplier tubes. So these direct detection experiments, there are dozens of them around the world right now. They're extremely sensitive, but they're most sensitive to heavy and fast particles because those are the particles that are going to give you the largest amount of nuclear recoil. Um, but what I'm going to argue is that the sun is actually a dark matter direct detection experiment. So <clears throat> if dark matter comes in, it can hit a nucleus in the sun. And if after that interaction, it falls below the local escape velocity, it is now gravitationally bound inside the sun. And over four and a half billion years, and given that the sun weighs two times 10 to the 30 uh, grams, kilograms, kilograms, um, you can actually accumulate a very, very large amount of dark matter, more than you would hope for in, say, five years in a, you know, five tons at Grand Sasso. So our mass is very large. It's mostly hydrogen, which is interesting for um, uh, one specific reason, at least. Uh, but you also have some helium. You have a very small amount of heavy elements, but still much larger than it than you could actually find on Earth. Um, so it's not super cooled, which means that you know, you, you're not going to de detect a scintillation signal or a phonon signal, although we'll get to, to the equivalent of that. So you need to be quite clever about how you actually read out the detection of dark matter. I, you need to look for new effects of dark matter in the sun. So before I go on, just to, to um, drive this point home a little bit, here, we're more sensitive with respect to Earth-based direct detection experiments to kind of the low end of the Maxwellian. So we're probing a different part of the parameter space because it's easier to slow down and capture particles that are already going slowly. And we're also sensitive to different types of interactions. 
So interactions that might be suppressed in the lab due to a you know, momentum exchange suppression or velocity suppression, like a, you know, I don't know, a Rutherford like force, um, will have a different range, different kinematic range that we're looking at in the sun. And therefore we're going to have a sensitivity to a different part of the parameter space. So these experiments are kind of complementary in that sense. And we'll see that in a couple of slides. So the easiest way of looking for dark matter in the sun, I, I think you, most of you have probably seen um, results about this, is if the dark matter accumulates, and then if it self annihilates, so if there's as much dark matter as anti-dark matter, or if dark matter is a Majorana particle, it's its own anti-particle, it can annihilate to stuff. And if that stuff is a muon or heavier, that will eventually produce neutrinos and we can go and look for those neutrinos. And these neutrinos are going to be at energies of GeV or higher, because that's kind of the, the dark matter range that we're sensitive here, that we're sensitive to here. That's the, the range in which we can lose kinetic energy, become bound and not evaporate out again. Um, there's no other process in the core of the sun that's producing GeV neutrinos. So there's a very clean signal of dark matter. And for spin dependent interactions, because the sun is made of hydrogen, uh, mostly, this turns out to be a very effective way of looking for dark matter. And you're basically, your annihilation rate at some equilibrium is basically limited by your capture rate, i.e. The, <clears throat> the amount of scattering of dark matter on hydrogen in the sun. And so this is a plot from, I, from IceCube presented at ICRC last year. Um, it's a very busy plot, but I want you to focus on the um, pink line here sort of lavender line, which is the best, the latest direct detection underground result. And these thick lines are the recent results from IceCube. And there's some model dependence because it depends on what you annihilate to, which in turn will give you a different spectrum of neutrinos that you see at Earth. So for example, for a leptonic annihilation, that, that tau plus tau minus, you see a very strong constraint um, from the neutrino channel. So here, while annihilating to two neutrinos, that's obviously a very clean signal. But even annihilation to tau plus tau minus, you get something that is very competitive with the latest direct detection experiments. So that's an annihilation. But that's kind of not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is what happens if there's no anti-dark matter, no annihilation. So in, uh, in practice, this means an asymmetric dark matter particle. So if there's no anti-dark matter to annihilate with, which is you know, the case for baryons, there's no, not a lot of anti-baryons lying around for us to annihilate with, fortunately, um, then the dark matter can accumulate. And you can really get a large population of dark matter accumulating in your star, accumulating in the sun over its lifetime. In the case of the sun, it's four and a half billion years. And what happens there is that, so the dark matter is very weakly interacting. So it can travel long distances, it's a, it's a very large mean free path. And what that means is that it can pick up energy in the core, bounce around a bit and travel a very long distance before it collides again. And at this point, its kinetic energy is much larger than the mean kinetic energy of the stuff around it. So when it collides, it on average will deposit energy. And what we have is a heat conductor. So the dark matter can actually conduct heat from the core outside, depositing energy on the outside, and changing the temperature profile and the pressure profile of the sun. So if we compare that with you know, the regular heat transport processes, which in the interior of a star like the sun are just radiative, so a photon you know, is going to just be bouncing around, this is a much, much, this is heat transport that it's, that's occurring on a much shorter time scale. So like I said, heat can be transported, changing the stellar temperature, and because a star is a ball of gas. If you change the temperature through the equation of state, you're changing the density and the pressure profiles. And so a little bit more um, rigorously, this is what it looks like. So you're removing heat from the center of the star and you're going and depositing it at higher radii. And note, this is, <clears throat> this is a sort of 5-ish GV dark matter particle. We're still not going that far. We're within you know, 0.1 of the radius of the star. So we're really within the core of the star for stars like the sun and particles that are not too weakly interacting. So how do I actually observe this? Well, if I have a change in the radial heat transport, I'm going to change the temperature profile. If I lower the temperature in the core of a star, there are certain parts of the PP fusion chain, 
which is the fusion of two protons into a helium that are extremely temperature dependent, in particular the boron eight uh, neutrino flux, which is um, the flux that we actually see the easiest on earth because it has a higher energy that goes as temperature to something like the 25th power. So even a small reduction in, in the core temperature gives you a massive reduction in the amount of neutrinos that you see. Um, there's a link here. This is a very Canadian joke, but I, which I can explain later. Um, the other thing that you can do if you're changing the temperature profile is through, as I said, through the equation of state change, the pressure um, and density, and therefore the sound speed. You can also change the location of the boundary of the convective zone. And if I then go and look at oscillations of the star, i.e. using helioseismology or asteroseismology generally, what I'm doing is I'm changing the frequencies of the oscillation eigenmodes. If I change the sound speed, I'm going to you know, change the relationship between mode and frequency. And through asteroseismology, I can go and figure out whether or not there's been such a shift. Uh, the convective zone boundary is a boundary, so we expect waves to bounce off of that. And we actually, through, as, through helioseismology, have an extremely precise measurement of where the boundary of the convective zone is in, in the sun, for example. And this kind of brings me to the solar composition problem, which is what got us into this um, in the first place. And this is a problem that appeared in 2004. Um, and effectively, in 2004, some groups had, or a group had been modeling the line formation in the photosphere in order to get a more precise determination of the elemental abundances in, in the sun. And by doing a th full 3D model, they actually found that the abundances that they measured compared with the, the abundances that we actually, we had just from the 1D um, photosphere models were somewhere between 10 and 30% lower. So in particular, C, N, and O are about you know, 0.1 dex lower than we thought they should be. Um, and the radius of the convective zone also moved, um, which meant that the reconstructed sound speed that we got by comparing standard solar models with the actual measured abundances moved from something that's in very good agreement. So the standard solar model, so this is the data minus model over data. So the standard solar model used to do quite well, that's using old abundances in the blue curve um, to something that really doesn't match at all. So this is known as the standard solar model, uh, as the solar composition problems or solar abundance problem um, because it came to light because of the solar abundances. Um, and it's telling us that the sound speed is off by something like four to five sigma, that in addition to the radius of the convective zone being um, not being where it's predicted to be. So something that you can do by changing the amount of heat transport, you can adjust the location of, you can change the sound speed profile by changing the temperature pro profile, therefore the pressure profile. Um, and by including different types of dark matter, you can bring your but you bring your sound speed that you predict more in line with observations. So here's a plot of mine showing the uh, helioseismology error and the mo modeling error and sort of solar st standard solar model bringing things down using a particular dark matter model with interactions that go as some power of the exchange momentum. So you can think of it as some kind of non-relativistic effective theory of the interactions. Um, so regular dark matter models, just billiard ball scattering doesn't actually address the problem um, and certainly doesn't within parameter space that's still allowed by direct detection experiments. So that's fun. If we move beyond the sun, if we look at dark matter and other stars, you can do even more fun things. So um, for a star that has a mass of more than 1.3 solar masses, we know that because the temperature gradients in the core are so steep, you wind up developing hydrostatic instabilities and you develop a convective core where your interior of the star becomes well mixed. So the fusion is happening inside this convective core. Um, what the dark matter can do if it's softening the temperature gradient by moving, by providing an extra channel of heat transport is remove that breakdown of hydrostatic equilibrium and erase that core. 
Um, here is just a little simulation by Jordi Casaneas, where in the case of when you have dark matter, you decrease the temperature of the core because you're evacuating um, heat more efficiently. And you go from this sharp boundary of the convective core. This is the fraction of this is the temperature here. This is the fraction of hydrogen in the core to something much more smooth when you add the dark matter and you get rid of any um, discontinuities in the um, in the sound speed pro. So this is the sound speed profile as a function of radius. So there's a a break at the convective zone uh, when you're convective when you hit the radius of your convective core and that's just erased and you can actually detect this using astro seismology and in fact the same group went and did an analysis using kepler space telescope data and found that they could infer the presence of convective cores and from that rule out certain models of dark matter just by looking at these um, slightly more massive stars in the nearby galaxy if you have large amounts of dark matter, things become even more fun. So just as a reminder, this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Your luminosity is on the vertical axis and temperature is on the horizontal axis and goes from small to, to from low to large because astronomers don't make a lot of sense. Um, and the main sequence here is the sequence of, so the population of hydrogen burning stars, stars that fuse hydrogen into helium to maintain hydrostatic equilibrium against the crush of gravity. So the sun's over here somewhere. And here we have small red stars and up here, big blue stars. And the, the amount of time that you spend on the main sequence as a star depends on how much gravitational pressure there is. You'll burn your fuel faster if there's more pressure, but also on the amount of fuel you have available to fuse. So that is the amount of hydrogen in the core that's hot enough to actually get nuclear fusion. So when your star exhausts its hydrogen supply, it leaves the main sequence and becomes a red giant. So this is when its core collapses, leading to a massive increase in luminosity, puffs up because of that extra luminosity and becomes redder because of the Stefan Boltzmann law. Um, so we can't obviously see if a star's lifetime has changed because of dark matter, but we can look at populations of stars and sort of figure out if the point at which they're turning off the main sequence is consistent with standard stellar evolution, or if we need something else to explain that turnoff, because this population, this is basically telling you that I have a population that's this old and all the stars are aging together and they're leaving the main sequence at some point as the bigger stars exhaust their hydrogen first, followed by the medium stars, followed by the smaller stars. So it's a bit like looking at populations of humans to understand aging rather than sitting and watching a single human as they age. That would be a, very difficult for a funding agency to, uh, to agree to. So uh, there was a, a very interesting paper that came out a couple of years ago, looking at this um, effect specifically. And the, this is actually not the first paper to point this out, um, but they did find that large amounts of dark matter does change the trajectory on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So it will change the way in which these stars age. Um, another thing for, in case you're into the technical pieces of this, they also found that previous claims of temperature inversions at the center of stars caused by this heat transport were actually just numerical artifacts, um, which is, interesting in itself because we've been arguing about that for the last, we being everyone, uh, for the last 10 years or so. So I think more interestingly from that particular paper, if you look at the main sequence li lifetime, so this is the change in the main sequence lifetime with respect to the case where there's no dark matter. If you look at low mass stars, so the sun is here, um, as you increase the amount of dark matter, that's the bluer and bluer curves, you wind up extending the amount of, so you wind up extending the size of the core and you wind up with more of the core of the star that is, that can sustain nuclear fusion. And therefore you wind up with a longer lifetime on the main sequence. And then as you get to that threshold where the convective core should develop, but gets erased by dark matter, 
you're actually removing the convective core, you're stopping any kind of mixing, and therefore you remove a large amount of the um, hydrogen that should have been available to burn. So you're actually decreasing the lifetime of these heavier stars. Sometimes if there's, you know, 10 to the six times the amount of dark matter in the, uh, with respect to where we are, to our particular position in the Milky Way, um, you know, this is a near 50% decrease in the lifetime of these stars, um, which is really fun. But all of this is wrong. Um, so it's not, the conclusions are probably not, they're probably fine qualitatively, but there's a very, very large technical issue with how all of this works. And that's the second half of my talk. So we're about to get technical, but I can pause here um, in case there are any questions. I think Victor has a question. Uh, hi, Aaron. Uh, just a, a quick question on the on the prof temperature profile of the stars. They show that uh, it changes when the when you add dark matter. Is the energy deposited in the center of the star uh, because of dark matter interaction influence the temperature in the core? So for these particular, so here we're talking about sort of GeV to TeV scale dark matter. And there, are, are you talking about just the capture of dark matter itself? Yeah, yeah, it's the positive energy in this capture is influenced. Right, somehow. so for very, for much heavier dark matter, that can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there have been a good number of papers about this in the last couple of years. For these particular um, dark matter models, no. The, okay. that kinetic energy is sort of, it's a very diffuse process. So it's sort of one nucleus at a time. So we're, we're looking at really, really subtle effects here. But yeah, for like asteroid sized dark matter um, there, yeah, you, you can get all sorts of fun um, things going on. So I think you, you need to be, become quite heavy in order to, so in some models you can actually produce a black hole if you accumulate enough very heavy dark matter. Um, I suppose, yeah, if you accumulate a huge amount of like wimp-like dark matter and itself annihilates, then you can wind up giving it, giving the star an extra power source, which will also extend its lifetime. Um, and that sort of starts to approach those dark star models that um, say Katie Freeze has been working on for quite a while now. Thanks. I have, I have a question if I may. Uh, so you were talking about having only dark matter accumulate, but not anti-dark matter or how would that work? I mean, they're both gravitationally bound, right? So in asymmetric dark matter models, for example, you tie the dark matter production mechanism to the baryon production mechanism. And you, you can, in, in some cases, you can just get no anti-baryons and no anti-dark matter because you annihilate. So if, if you have some initial asymmetry, you annihilate away the anti-dark matter and you, you don't have anything that self-annihilates. You could be more, um, you, you could make it more complicated and have interactions that are dependent on the dark matter versus, so you could have dark matter baryon interactions, which are different from anti-dark matter baryon interactions. Um, as, as long as you have some asymmetric population of dark matter in the star, this will work. And uh, obviously if it interacts with baryons. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have Could I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Hey, Aaron. Uh, so I was thinking about this like solar abundance problem. I've I've talked with different people on this, and some people say like it's very those results from like seismology are very robust, and some people seem to say that they're not really. So I I had a general question about that, like how how sure are we that there is a solar abundance problem, and then also in your plot where you. I don't remember the quantity, maybe it was the, the sound speed as a function of radius or something, but you had this like middle line, which was statistical error. And then you had some, right here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the modeling error, which kind of blows up. And that's also where the measurements seem to be discrepant. And then where yeah. the modeling error shrinks, it like, 
it drops again, right? So what what is that modeling error? Maybe you can comment on that as well. That's a good, oh, yeah. Um, I should know that. After so I produced this plot like seven years ago. Um, some of it, I believe, is the, un so there, there's uncertainties in things like the nuclear cross sections. There's uncertainties in things like the opacity. Um, if, if you were to make me bet, I would probably think that, so for, I, I haven't seen any robust criticism of the helioseismology inversions. That's not to say that they're not there. Um, the opacities are something that we probably don't understand very well, just because this is, um, you know, heat transport, photon heat transport inside a plasma at a temperature and density that we just can't do anything about in the lab. There are three different groups in the world that make these opacity tables that are used in these stellar simulations. They don't agree with each other, but even given that, um, get, given that range, you can't really bring down. So this is this is mainly an issue here, uh, yeah. where you see the peak. That's probably if dark matter is a solution, it's probably not going to solve this particular peak either. Um, but even then, if you include all those the different opacity calculations, it doesn't seem to account for this. So there could be something just fundamentally wrong about the opacities. Um, I yeah, like I said, I, I'm I'm not aware of any anyone claiming they have a different helioseismology inversion? Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is one question by Elcilia. Elcilia, do you wanna uh, read it or? Yes, yeah. uh, if okay. I may now. Yeah, so I was, uh, hi Aaron, I was just wondering, um, so I know that like in the standard solar models, uh, for example, the precision on the sound speed uh, affects, for example, uh, some upper and lower limits that have been set for the magnetic field uh, in the sun uh, in each zone, for example. So I was wondering if there is a change that you expect in the in the sun speed. So this should somehow affect also the model for the magnetic field. Not the model, sorry, but the limits and estimated. Oh, that's a good question. I, I don't actually know all that much about that. I know the so the. Magnetic fields in the sun are extremely uncertain. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of what- Okay, okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if, because I know that uh, like uh, in the current model, there are some limits that have been set uh, starting from the precision on the sun speed. So I guess that of course there should be also some change in these limits. Uh, if you have like, you know, this kind of model for dark matter in the sun. Yeah, well, well, we, we're still kind of moving around the same ballpark here. So, and th these are very small changes in the sound speed. So I'm not sure you would, that would propagate to anything significant in the, in the magnetic fields. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. That makes sense also because the uncertainties are really high on this. Okay, sure. I see, thanks. Uh, the, the, the other thing I should mention about this is, so th this is the, sort of easier to interpret plot of the sound speed um, model versus theoretical. But in actual fact, when you're trying to fix, when, you, when you're trying to understand the um, helioseismology, especially in the core region where it's extremely discrepant, um, what you can do is you can take ratios of, or differences in frequency modes, which basically removes all of the, all of the propagation of errors. So it removes the error induced by um, higher radii where things can be um, messier and you wind up with some extremely precise um, observable that you can compute. And there the dark matter really makes things look very nice. I, I show this plot because it's, it's easier to interpret than some random set of data. All right, I see no other hand, so I think we, we can go on. Okay, uh, and when would you like me to end? When you're done. <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, just uh, you have uh, about uh, 25 minutes or so. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so so let's keep going. So we're, we're going to get to the, we're getting to a technical part here, um, but bear with me because I think it's it's interesting and important in addressing all of these questions. So 
I told you what dark matter does, but I haven't actually told you really how it does it. And to understand what happens when you accumulate this population of dark matter inside a star and what its distribution is going to be and how it's going to then transport heat, what you need to do is solve a Boltzmann equation. Um, and Boltzmann equations are notoriously difficult. So this is the schematic Boltzmann equation that we're sol solving. It looks fairly simple. So F is the phase space distribution of your dark matter, velocity, radius, position, and time. D is a Louisville operator. So it's a differential operator that takes into account things like gravity. So it's a, it's a bunch of derivatives and local gravitational acceleration, gravitational potential. C is a collision operator, which is a bunch of integrals, which takes into account collisions between dark matter particles and baryonic particles. Um, and this L here, this is going to be important. This is roughly, this goes as one over the cross section. This is the mean free path of the dark matter. So this is a six dimensional integral differential equation. And if you want to solve this as a star evolves from a protostellar halo, you need to solve it at every time step in stellar evolution. And that's just not possible. So even assuming equilibrium, we can get rid of that T and then it's only six dimensional, not seven, uh, not seven dimensional. Assuming local equilibrium, so equilibrium of the dark matter on the time scale at which this, the star evolves is a good assumption. Um, but still, we're left with something that is fundamentally, well, you, you can't really solve by hand. Uh, here's what it looks like just for fun. And I haven't even expanded out the collision operator, um, but it's derivatives equals integrals. And there's a cross section here, that sigma, which is telling you the strength of the interaction between the dark matter and the stellar stuff. So we can break this down into a couple of regimes. If your cross section is very small, your interactions are really weak. So your dark matter goes a long way, um, but can't really efficiently transfer momentum. So your conduction is going to be suppressed. On the other side, if your interactions are very strong, the dark matter can very efficiently hit stuff, but is so efficient that it can't go anywhere. So heat transport is again going to be inefficient. And there's a midpoint called the Knudsen peak of optimal heat transport where your dark matter is traveling, traveling a long enough distance and transferring a large, large enough amount of energy to make a sizable impact. And so these three regimes are sort of a way of separating out how to solve our Boltzmann equation. Here's what it looks like a bit more, a little bit more quantitatively. So on the right here, so this is the, what's called the Knudsen number, which is gonna be an important quantity. Uh, that's the mean free path over the typical size of the problem, over the scale radius of the dark matter. So you can think of this as being proportional to the mean free path or one over the cross section. And so we have our isothermal regime, which was on the left. This is when the mean free path is very long and we have our other regime, our tightly coupled regime when the mean free path is very small. And there are two different ways of approaching these, two different approximations that were developed in the 80s and 90s, well, in the 80s, um, that are used to solve this Boltzmann equation in these two limits, but under some approximations. Uh, but in the center, which is where we would get the largest effect, we're really stuck between these two opposing regimes that are not compatible with each other. And we need to figure out, A, are these correct? And B, what do we do here? So I'm gonna go through these two approaches, uh, convince you that everything is wrong and we'll find a hack that works and I'll show you why it works. So uh, yeah, as I said, the Knudsen number is going to be important. This is our basically our mean free path. So in the limit where the mean free path is quite long, your, your dark matter is kind of, it's flying all over the place. It's sort of in these orbits around the core of the sun and the dark matter at any given time, a specific part of particle could be kind of anywhere. And therefore it's sampling an ensemble, it's sampling a, a heat bath, which is weighted by the dark matter distribution. So you can model this as approximately uh, contactless. And then your distribution becomes the Maxwell-Boltzmann. The Maxwell-Boltzmann is just the solution to this equation, to the, to the Boltzmann equation with no collisions. Um, so you have something like e to the minus half mv squared over some temperature and an extra term to account for the gravitational potential. So the dark matter is at a single temperature, T chi, 
which is like the average of all the temperatures that it's interacting with. And so then you can treat the conduction as just contact between two weakly coupled heat baths. And so your conduction is going to go as the cross section interaction rate times the difference between the temperatures of these two heat baths. So when the temperature of the star is higher than the temperature of the dark matter, the dark matter will cool the star. And in places where the dark matter temperature, say over here, is larger than the temperature of the star locally, the dark matter is going to heat it up. And so you're removing heat and then putting it in. And this has been known to be incorrect since 1990. Um, so a paper by Gould and Raffelt in 1990 went and did a Monte Carlo simulation of what was going on inside a star. And they found that, so this assumption of a single temperature, dark matter at a single temperature is just never realized. So this is a very simplified star, but basically you have radius of the star and temperature and the isothermal temperature that you're assuming is this thing here. And the nuclei temperature, so again, a simplified setup is this line here. And the actual dark matter temperature is going to be something in between, which you would kind of expect. And so they found that the temperature, that the thermal conduction by this dark matter modeled in this way, overestimated heat transport by a factor of two. This is in the long, in the long mean free path regime. The assumptions there should be justified, but you're still off by a factor of two. So what Golden Raffelt did is they went and developed their own approximation scheme in the other direction. In the case where the mean free paths are very short, where the Spergel and Press approximation breaks down. And there, if your mean free path is much, much smaller than your scale length, conduction is going to be local and the temperature of the dark matter should be pretty much the same temperature as the nuclei within, like at, at a given point. So this is the local thermal equilibrium approximation. So then you can go and expand your Boltzmann equation in a series in some small quantity, namely the mean free path. Um, and you can solve this. So you expand it in a series and then expand it in multiples and just solve for the dipole part. So you, you'll have a, Maxwell, a Maxwellian velocity distribution with a slight dipole and that slight dipole corresponds to local energy transport. And this looks like a mess and trust me, it is. They actually develop a direct formalism to deal with it. But what you wind up with is actually quite elegant. You wind up with expressions for the distribution of dark matter and the heat transport, which depend only on these. So, you know, there's things like derivatives of the temperature, which feels very statistical mechanically, mechanically. Um, but the microphysics only really depends on this alpha here and this kappa here, which only depend on the ratio of the dark matter mass to the nuclear mass. And so once you derive these alphas and kappas, you can just go and plug things into this equation and it just works. Um, it doesn't really just work. So they went and out of fairness, compared their results to their Monte Carlo simulation. And they found that you need an additional two corrections. One of those corrections we, we could have anticipated is from the fact that this assumes a small mean free path. Uh, and when your mean free path is large, you have to somehow correct for that. And that's some empirical thing. The other correction that you need is from the fact that when you're near the center of the star, you don't really have a pure dipole because if, if the center is here, there's heat going the wrong way as you approach the center because it's all traveling radially outward. So there's actually less heat transport in the center of the star than you thought there would be. So you need this additional suppression. So that's what this little suppression is at small radii. And every single result in the past 30 years that has been correct has used basically a fit to this graph that I'm showing right here. There are two values of the mean free path and you, you get this kind of cubic thing. And this correction has been what has been used in the majority of the literature that claims to do things precisely. Unfortunately, there's another problem with this, and that is that this approach, this correct approach, is also extremely numerically unstable. So people use the first approach, the Spergel and Press approach, um, as well. Even though, well, okay, if your cross sections are very large or very small, you're only off by a factor of two. So we wind up with this picture where 
in the LTE regime, we have that golden Riffelt approach. This regime, which golden Riffelt showed is wrong. And what the correct approach is in quotes is you take the golden Riffelt approach, you give it this Knudsen correction and that other correction. And then you're allowed to explore this regime, which is the small cross-section limit, which is what's allowed by direct detection. This is actually, you know, what's interesting. Or, you know, maybe explore the Knudsen transition if you have a particular type of dark matter that's still allowed by direct detection. Um, I'm going to add a little, um, maybe a little bit of a deviation, and that is to look at, to think about non-constant cross-sections because of course the interactions between two particles are not generically billiard ball constant um, blast or isotropic interactions. You could have things like a one over R force, which give you, I don't know, a long range force. You could have different types of interactions which depend on velocity and momentum. If you think about that relativistically, that's just saying that your matrix element depends on S, T and U, the Mendelstam variables. And in the non-relativistic limit, it depends on whatever non-relativistic quantum numbers you have, relative velocity, exchange momentum, and spin. So to adapt those non-constant cross-sections to both of these methods is straightforward but tedious. So we did that in one paper back in 2013 in the golden Riffelt approach. And we did it again in this particular paper for the Spergel and Press uh, work. And so the expressions look kind of similar, but you kind of you need to change a few things. You, get, you wind up with extra powers, I would say, um, the uh, temperature average um, and some extra coefficients from doing some integrals. But it's, it's not too complicated. OK, so what we set out to do was to see if either of these solutions are correct and in what regime are they, are they correct? And can we put together a formalism that actually helps us model heat transport in a star without having to do a Monte Carlo at every time step. So of course, we're going to do a Monte Carlo. The inputs to this are a dark matter mass, a cross section, and a type of interaction, because we're looking at non-constant interactions as well. We initialize the, the, the particle, the dark matter particle, somewhere inside the star, and we just let it bounce around. And by the ergodic theorem, the positions and velocities that it traces in phase space are going to correspond to the equilibrium distribution of many particles that you would expect. Um, and the, if we map, if we track each collision, we also know how much heat is transported by this dark matter particle inside this particular star. So we're assuming the star isn't changing just because the time scales for this dark matter equilibrium are much smaller than the time scales that the star evolves on. Um, here's the technical slide that I'm going to skip because I'm already low on time. Um, so thousands of CPU hours later, and this is really Hannah who ran so many Monte Carlo simulations on the Imperial cluster, even though none of us worked at Imperial anymore. Um, this is Monte Carlo, by the way. Uh, we found some fun conclusions. So the first one was that, yeah, the dark matter, if we look at the star's temperature versus the isothermal what you expect the dark matter temperature to be in the large mean free path limit, the, as you decrease the cross section, the dark matter becomes more and more isothermal, but is never quite isothermal. And I think this is going to come back to bite us in a second, but that's confirming that one result that we can, can't really say the dark matter is, is isothermal. Okay. Now let's look at some heat transport curves. So what I'm going to plot are in green with these error bars, the results of the Monte Carlo simulation for different values of the cross section. So here, these are 10 GeV and the model, the star is the sun. So it's the sun's temperature profile. We took a slightly simplified um, gravitational potential just so that the orbits could be analytic, but that shouldn't make much of a difference. On the left, you have the luminosity, the, the luminosity of the dark matter. So emission. Um, on the right, which is a bit more intuitive, is the transported energy. And you can see it being removed at low radii in these two models and deposited at high radii. So energy removed from the core and deposited. So the simulation is doing what we think it's doing. Actually, 
we verified that it gave exactly the same results as that golden or felt paper from, from the 90s. But whereas they did five simulations, we're doing thousands, uh, maybe not thousands, maybe just a few hundred. Um, and so as expected in the large cross section, local thermal equilibrium regime, so very small mean free path, golden or felt and purple, that approximation scheme does pretty well. Spurgle and Press is very wrong because it assumes a long mean free path and that's not the regime that we're in. That's the, um, the orange line here. If we look at these small uh, cross sections, so the long mean free path isothermal regime, there that golden refelt approximation does pretty well as well because it's been corrected to death so that it matches what's going on. Um, Spurgle and Press looks better, like the shape actually looks closer to what the Monte Carlo simulation gives us, but they're off by that factor of two. So this is not great, it's not terrible, but let's look at non-constant cross sections. So our Spurgle, of, Spurgle and Press, interestingly, is off by a factor of two. <laughs> cool. Golden Riffelt is just not in the same, not on the same planet. Right, that's the purple versus these Monte Carlo results. So I've put that luminosity in the big panels and the heat transport in the insets here. And these are just different types of dark matter nucleus interactions. So this is not good. This is a bit of a disaster. So what happened? Well, if we have non-constant interactions, that means our mean free path now depends on where you are in the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Um, and the dipole assumption that you make in that local thermal equilibrium approximation, it just, it's probably not a good one because what's going on here, so you might have something that's very local here, but very non-local here. And what it seem, what seems to be the case is that that um, isothermal assumption that we just have heat baths is just a lot more robust to things not being Maxwellian. So, what do we know? We know that the original Spurgle and Press actually gives a better shape than the kind of more precise but strongly interacting regime from Golden Refelt. We know that the LTE approximation doesn't make much sense anymore because saying we're going to take an approximation for a very small, so very for strongly interacting dark matter, when we know that from direct detection experiments that dark matter has to have a very small cross section. That doesn't make any sense because we'd have to extrapolate into the wrong regime. In the isothermal regime, we know that Spurgle and Press works, it's just off by a factor of two. And so why not do what people were doing before, but say, correct that Spurgle and Press for small k so that it works in the local thermal equilibrium, so that it works in the LTE regime as well. And we have this very simple picture, which is, so the Spurgle and Press approach, the luminosity goes as the inverse of the Newton number. It's proportional to the cross section. And in the strongly interacting case, we know that the luminosity is proportional to the mean free path. So we can just correct the Spurgle and Press approach and say, well, I have some factor that just interpolates between these two approaches empirically at some transition here, it's gonna turn over and I divide by two because I have looked everywhere for that factor of two. And I think it's just a fundamental problem with the, what the, the assumptions that we made. Probably that temperature, which is never quite the isothermal temperature. And what we get is the blue curve. So this is going from strong interactions, the Knudsen transition. So this is where heat transport is highest to very weak interactions. And across the board, that very simply corrected isothermal Spurgle and Press calculation does beautifully. So you can see your heat transport down here compared with the other two approaches. And then if we look at V to the N or Q to the N, uh, different types of dark matter nucleus interactions, we also looked at different masses and we did it for two different types of stars, one which was the sun, one which is a star that had a radius of two and a half meters and the dark matter weighed a kilogram, um, just to, for silly reasons, but it worked in both cases. Um, so we have this very, very robust, simple approach that seems to just work across 
different types of dark matter, different masses, and different types of star. And this is just looking at different models. So the, the location where this model predicts the maximum luminosity, or sorry, the maximum luminosity predicted by the model. So uh, compared against the maximum luminosity inferred from the Monte Carlo simulation. So these are all the, the seven types of dark matter nucleus interactions that we looked at. V is relative velocity, Q is exchange momentum um, across this huge range of cross sections. And they match very, very well, which is quite nice. Um, and of course, the next step, and I realize I'm running out of time, is to actually take this formalism, throw it into stellar simulations and see what happens. And that's what we're working on right now to see, does this change our picture of what's going on with dark matter and stars? And can we infer some more robust limits on dark matter nucleus interactions? Um, to summarize, heat transport in stars can affect neutrinos, astroseismology, main sequence lifetime, more than that. We have two contradictory approximations from the 80s. We've gone and tested them empirically with the Monte Carlo simulation, and we found that the quote, correct approach is not the correct approach, and actually a very simple modification to the simple, the more simple way of calculating heat transport is very, very robust. Um, and the effect in simulations is to be determined. And so this is my summary of a summary. Um, so there lies Gulden Refelt, slain by young Banks et al. that slew thy kinsman, brave Spurgle in press. Uh, so thank you. And I'll leave this up here. Thank you very much, Aaron. It was, it was wonderful. Uh, yeah, also, I, 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 I knew Andy Gould. Uh, I think he might have appreciated that thing. Uh, do we have any questions for Aaron? Marcus has one. Yeah, hi, very nice talk, Aaron. Um, I was wondering, I have actually two questions. Uh, so when you mention the dipole in the first part in your talk, uh, do I understand this correctly? You mean a local dipole that is there, like a, a gradient of dark matter, which induces some flow of dark matter? Uh, it's a gradient in the temperature, in the thermal distribution. Right. So it's a dipole in the Maxwellian. So you have your Maxwellian, which is isotropic right. locally, and you have a slight dipole, which then if you, if you look at what the velocity distribution looks like. It looks like a, um, a slight correction to the Maxwell-Boltzmann. So you're, you have a slight removal of velocity and an increase in high velocity pieces. And that, that dipole is always pointing outwards. But yeah, so um, I mean, you start with a, a stellar system, which is approximately spherical symmetric. So the dipole is not uh, like a global resonance, but it's, it's still, from the point of view of a local uh, fluid part. And so the dipole is basically scaling with the gradient, right? The, the, uh, it's, it's scaling with the temperature gradient, um, but it's, it's, it's really a dipole in the velocity distribution at, at every point. Right? So you, you go to a, a given point and you, you look at the phase space distribution and you wind up with the dipole that, that's pointing radially outwards. Radially, okay, okay. And, and, and then, um, yeah, the, the other question that I had was, so when you do your Monte Carlo uh, test particle simulations, I guess if you want to find out the heat transport, you also have to include some back. Did, did he just freeze? Reaction to this, right? Sorry, I mean, Marcus. Uh, oh. Marcus, sorry. Yeah, yeah, Can you hear me? Yeah. You, you just froze, but I, you I, I understood the question. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so no, we're, we're, we're not using, we're not including any kind of back reaction. So the, the assumption there is that the um, effect on the stellar structure is small enough that it's not going to change. The, 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 the change in the stellar structure is, is slow enough that you're not going to get an appreciable change on that time scale of the, the dark That's matter distribution. And then that's pretty well justified for the amount of dark matter that we're talking about here. Um, the, the, the way to really include that back reaction is to do a full stellar simulation and do both of these things dynamically. Mm -hmm. um, but we can't do it with a Monte Carlo because that's 
um, that would be ridiculous and time consuming. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, it shows all my middle names, but I go by Axel. Well, uh, thanks for a nice talk, Aaron. Uh, so, like when you look at the internal goings on of the sun, you can put it in dark matter, you can have different types of cross sections that have different velocity dependencies and so on. So, uh, it was, it's some time ago now, but I wrote this work uh, on dark matter captured by the sun where dark matter is strongly self interacting. So, there's quite a lot of like play room there to like have fairly strong self interactions, especially if you have some uh, self interacting dark matter subcomponents. But is this something you've thought about in relation to uh, the solar abundance problem? Uh we I've thought about it. I haven't really looked into it in a lot of detail. So so yeah, I mean, well, you, you know that adding some self-interaction gives you can enhance your capture rate, which is really nice. Um, for heat transport, so the, the both of these approximations are in the sort of dilute gas approximation where you're assuming that the, the particles are just so diffuse that even if they had some non-zero interaction rate, it wouldn't be all that important. If you start to change that and you add self interactions, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking you'll, you'll get something a bit like the self interacting dark matter discussion that we have about, you know, galaxies where it's going to start changing the phase space distribution. Right. And then that's going to then affect the heat transport that you, that you wind up. Uh, yeah. The, the heat transport gradient. Yeah. That's that's sort of yeah. That's kind of one of the next steps that um, there's like twenty next steps that we that we want to yeah. look at. That's one of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll be very curious to hear about that later. Yeah. Well, as you saw, just regular dark matter baryon interactions, as people started looking at in the eighties, is complicated. So this took four years of, of much of yeah. <laughs> That's a complicated question. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Right, I see no other hand. Uh, Victor has another question, please go ahead. Yeah, just one quick question. I don't know if this is sadly related to the topic. Do you have any rough estimates of how my, what percentage of dark matter would be contained in stars in a galactic halo, for example? Yeah, okay, I didn't say that. Um, so for the sun at our particular position, that is about 10 to the minus 10. And that's enough to give you a, an observable effect. So if you were to go to the galactic center, um, depending on what profile you believe, you could enhance that by three, six orders of the magnitude. Um, and that that number, so that, that 10 to the minus 10, that comes from four and a half billion years of the sun accumulating all the dark matter it can. So that's turning up the cross section large enough that you're basically in the cosmic vacuum cleaner limit mm -hmm. where you're just eating everything, including from gravitational focusing. So as, as you decrease the cross section, obviously you're decreasing that. Um, so the some of the results I showed, like um, so this particular plot. So this this gamma, that's the ratio of dark matter captured, of ratio of amount of dark matter to the local density. So this is like the black curve here is 10 to the six times the local density, which is plausible in some astrophysical environments. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I was just thinking whether the a large accumulation of dark matter inside the stars uh, that is being cool, cooled down could potentially change the, the galactic structure since you are modifying the, the halo. Yeah, I don't I don't think you're ever eating enough dark matter to do that. Okay. In okay. Scenario, so. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right. Uh, maybe in closing, can I ask a final question? Then it it goes to the beginning of, of your talk, and uh, you were talking about how the distribution of, of uh, temperatures of uh, groups of stars can give you some information about uh, whether there's dark matter or not. And my mm -hmm. question is, how robust is this? How well do we know the like the what would be the distribution of, of temperatures without dark matter? Yeah, that, no, that's really a key question. Um, so, so far, everyone who's done this has basically done something like this and simulated 10 stars and said, in principle, we can use populations to figure things out. 
I'm not aware of anyone who's actually gone and done the legwork um, of looking at populations of stars, figuring out what would I predict in a certain population given, I don't know, just a spread in metallicities and how would dark matter affect that? And that's, that's one thing that I wanna do um, because it, th there've been a lot of papers, just yeah, theory papers looking at individual or lifetimes of individual stars, but no one's really done the population thing. Partly that's because to do, um, so I, I talked to, so I, I've done a lot of, of stellar simulations. The, the ones in the sun take about 24 hours. Uh, I talked to the grad student who did this. He said each simulation was 20 days on eight cores. So to get a sizable population there, you need to be very clever. Um, so we're, we're developing some tools to try to <laughs> speed things up. And hopefully we'll be able to say something about populations. The other thing, the other hope is using astro seismology again um, and using satellites like Kepler or some of the next generation. See, TESS is apparently not that good. Uh, but all these exoplanet telescopes, they're actually very good at astro seismology because what they're looking for is tiny changes in luminosity from a, the transit of a planet in front of a star. But an oscillating star is a tiny change in luminosity if you're just looking at the radial modes. So I think in the short term, we might have more luck with astro seismology. In the longer term, I want to throw every every processor I have and sure. try to get some population simulated. Yeah. That sounds interesting. But that's a really, that's one of the key questions. Like, And it, when you're doing indirect detection, that's always the problem. Right, right. There's right. astrophysics you need to account for. Yeah. All right, thanks. and. Um... I don't see any more urgent questions. So uh, thank you again, Aaron. Uh, and uh, remember, Aaron is one of the organizers of TEFPA later this year. So give it a look. Abstracts, abstract submission is open. So you know what to do. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Talk to you soon. And uh, everybody see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks. Bye-bye.